Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. Uh, once again, we have the worship team from Pacific Life Bible College joining with us to lead us in worship. Going to be a great time with them. And then Pastor Tom is here for week two in our new series. We're all in this together. He's going to be unpacking today what the church is and what the church isn't. And I am incredibly excited to hear the word that God has put on his heart and the insights that he has to share with us. Now, just before we get to the service, I want to extend a very special invite to everyone. On Sunday, September the 12th, we are going to be doing Welcome Home Sunday. We recognize that for the last year and a half, we've been online, we've been in person, we've been outside, we've been inside. So as we come into the fall, and hopefully as we come closer and closer to what normal is going to look like moving forward, we want to give an opportunity for everyone who calls Sunshine Hills Church home to come back together in person for a special time together. So on that Sunday, we're going to have our coffee shop open once again. We're going to be doing a free hot dog barbecue in the parking lot following service. And we're going to be kicking off some brand new things for this fall and announcing some big events we have coming up in the fall as well. So if you have yet to come back together with us in person, or if you have tried it out and are looking for that right time to come back once again, I want to encourage you and invite you to come on Sunday, September 12th for our Welcome Home Sunday. We hope to see you there. We'd love to connect with you once again. All right. Are you ready? Are you excited? Here we go. Church starts now. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. You have done great things. He has done great things. And break every chain, oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and delight Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high, oh God You have done great things Through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things, God, you do great things.
How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into night And through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living God. Who could imagine? So great a mercy What heart can fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living home. Hallelujah, praise the one who said me.
precious grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Come down, Father. Every blessing Tune my heart to sing that grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some of those songs My flame in tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it The mount of thy changing
I have the privilege of following up Pastor Danny's message last week. And uh, without being self-serving, I've said that um, I, I'm in love with two women. One, of course, was my beloved Lottie, and the other was the Church of Jesus Christ, the bride. This is my one of my all-time favorite topics. I love talking about the bride of Christ. I love talking about the church and what it was meant to be. Well, uh, my topic today is the church rediscovered. It's rediscovered. It's not reimagined. It's not redesigned. It's not reinvented. It doesn't need to be any of those things. It needs to be rediscovered. Jesus established his church, and he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Again, this is found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And we need to make sure that we, we put this into its context. Some people say, you know, and Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. It wasn't Peter that the church was going to be built upon. Peter was just a person. But it was that fact that Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he was acknowledging the fact that that was and must always be the center focus of the church. That is not built on personalities, it's not built on big buildings or program, but the church must always remember that its foundation remains sure when we embrace the fact that it is built upon the recognition that Jesus really is who he said he was and that we acknowledge that he is the Christ. I think a lot of our difficulties would go away if we would just zero in on that very simple and profound truth. Let's pray. Father, as we talk about your bride, Lord Jesus, we ask that you would give us heart, um, eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to respond. Lord, in a time of great confusion and great difficulty, when the church is in many ways reeling about who are we or what are we supposed to do, Oh, Lord, let us return back to the church like the one that you left. Lord, give us an understanding and give us the courage to be able to really stay on mission and on point. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to start by acknowledging and calling out that doing church is going to have to look very different as we walk forward. But the fundamental reality of church never changes. The methods may change. In fact, I would argue they must change, but the message must remain simple and timeless. Jesus, when he entered the world, he upset the apple cart. The Pharisees and the, the, the religious leaders of the first century, they said, this is the tradition of the elders. This is the way that we're supposed to do things. And Jesus came along and he upset the apple cart. They were really upset with him. He says, you can't do that. And Jesus says, watch me. But he wasn't being chippy. He wasn't trying to be an iconoclast. That means breaking down of idols and sacred things. But what Jesus was doing, he says, you have allowed this thing to become very convoluted. And we need to get back to the simplicity of what's really important here. God loves you. God loves his world. God loves people. And he has established his church. And we're going to define that. But he has established his church to be his representatives in a fallen world and to make a difference. That's what I'm about. I'm all about the fact that we need to refocus and rediscover what church is really supposed to be. Now, I was thinking about this, and there are times when I just forget things or I've lost things. And my experience is that rediscovering something that you have either lost or forgotten is a wonderful thing. And again, um, again, not to be self-serving, but I'm discovering this. Like, there was just so many things that I took for granted. And um, I was at one of the girls' houses, and, and uh, they were doing one of Lottie's recipes. I had forgotten about that. And so I was thinking, oh, I can do that. Not only is it a good meal, but it reminds me of her. So this rediscovery process is meant to be something not that is tedious, but it is meant to be something that when we find that which was lost, we rejoice like the parable Jesus taught about the lost penny or the lost sheep. He says that, that my sheep was lost and now it's found. Jesus is all about helping us to discover that which was lost. 
Now, I want us to look at the and have this opportunity to rediscover God's original plan for his church. Now, I want to ask some questions. Yeah, I love doing that. I think it's one of the things that engages us. So here's some questions. What do you think of when you hear the word church? Most people think of a building. And most people think of not just a building, but but a church has is as gothic in its 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 architecture, and it's got a steeple, and it's got all of the trappings. That's what lots of people think about when they think about the church. My next question is this: What do you think the average person on the street thinks about the church? My concern is. Because I feel the church through the centuries has lost its edge, I think people, it's not what they think about the church, but do they even think about church at all? Is it even in the conversation? Where do you think most people get their information about what church is to be or their opinions about the church? And again, as people of the television age, it often pains me and wounds me when I see how television and social media and media in general, how they caricaturize the church and they exaggerate things. And I say, that doesn't look anything like the church that Jesus came to establish. Unfortunately, because I feel that so often the church has really lost the pattern and the blueprint that Jesus laid down, that much of the criticism that we see in social media and on television, unfortunately, has a ring of truth. I feel that in this season of rediscovery here at Sunshine Hills, and also in this season of rediscovery as as the church around the world is saying, how do we uh, find ourselves, where do we go from here in this new world that will emerge out of this pandemic? Now, we can either wring our hands and we can be really concerned about it, or we can say, God, we can hardly wait to see how you're going to lead and guide us as we discover this wonderful, living, breathing organism called the church. Do you think people currently attending our church really understand the character and the nature of the church? Do you? Do I? And Finally, the last question is, what is the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ? My hope is that by the end of all of this, that somehow uh, we'll be able to have some answers to these things. Or if not answers, at least we have something to chew on and to think about. Well, I want to start uh, this way. I have found sometimes in trying to figure out something, it is a helpful exercise to start with what something is not. So what is the church not? First of all, it is not a closed social club. Now, growing up in a small community in Dover, Ohio, that uh, I remember talking with my friends, and there were people who attended church not because of their loyalty or their love of Jesus Christ, but it was the thing to be done. It was the socially accessible thing, and it became a place of networking. And, and one of the things that here at Sunshine Hills, we have committed to being a place of safety that very early on we established a policy that says we will not do business when we gather in this building. We will not allow this to be a place of the money changers. And Jesus was upset with the money changers because they had changed and twisted the place that was supposed to be a place of prayer because nobody was using it for a place of prayer. It wasn't the actual temple. It was part of the temple complex. But what happened was because the Jews were supposed to be there praying on behalf of the world, it wasn't being used. And so when things don't get used, other things creep in and it became a a marketplace. And Jesus said, you've made it a den of thieves. My concern is, have we twisted and perverted the real purpose of the church? Are people seeing us as a church showing up as authentic witnesses and representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are we seen as mere money changers who have exchanged the glory of the incredible love of God for just a group of activities and things that we do? It's, is it not? It is not an institution. It is not a business. 
It is not an entertainment center. Now, call me old-fashioned. Uh, but, you know, when, when uh, rock music was first around and then we, when, when there was MTV, I remember it when it was first around. And I was one of those people and still am one of those people. I like a stand up and play band. I don't, you don't have to blow up your guitars or have fancy lights. I would say, just lay down the music. Let the music speak for itself. I sometimes cons- am concerned that the church has exchanged the presence of God for production. Now, you may disagree with that, but I'd like you to think about it. We need to remember that first and foremost, when we gather, when the church gathers, the one thing that is something that we must never, ever, ever compromise on is above all else, we need to make sure that we are acknowledging and we are welcoming the presence of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. I've seen that happen where, you know, people will come in and they don't even know what's going on, but they start to cry or whatever. Oh God, let that always be the, 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 the case when we gather together that people are visibly moved by your presence when the church gathers. It's not a place, although we come to a place. It is not an activity and it is not an event. Oh, are you going to go to the to the latest movie or are you going to go to the football game or whatever? That church is not an event. It is something more. And sadly enough, it is not irrelevant. I'm very concerned that in people's dialogues, the church isn't even on the radar. I remember, I, I'm a child of the 70s, and I remember the Jesus People Movement where God supernaturally intervened into a group of, 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 of young adults that had lost their way with the free love and the drugs and, and the rejection of, of the establishment and how that God met them and changed their life, that they, those that were high came down. They, they didn't come to Jesus to become weirder. They came to Jesus to have their lives made whole. That's what the church is always supposed to be. Oh, Jesus, let that be true of us, that this is a place And when people come in contact with us, that the Holy Spirit begins to move in their hearts and that they recognize that they have a cavernous hole where their heart should be and that you are here to make them whole and well as they invite you in. So what is it meant to be? The church, and I put this down, and and the church is a group of people. The church is always people. It's not a place. It's not a building. It is first and foremost people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and have determined, chosen to live together in community under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in accordance with God's Word my prayer would be that you would think about that. So when you come, when you come, what are your expectations? What are my expectations? Do I come to say, well, you know, I really like when this person preaches, or I really like when this person leads worship through music, and somebody once upon a time coined the voice says, well, I didn't really like the music very much this morning, or the worship. And uh, somebody inverted the question and says, it wasn't whether I liked the worship, but was God pleased with my expressions of worship? That's what happens and should happen when the church gathers. Now, again, we have this challenge of language when referring to church. Uh, People say this, let's meet at the church. Well, that only reinforces this misconception that the church is the place. So what I will, I have really worked hard at language and I'll say, let's meet at the church building. The church is not the building. It's where the church meets. Or I'll say, I'm going to church. No, I'm going to a church service or I'm going to the church gathered. I really want to challenge you. I'm not trying to be goofy or stupid or strange or or bizarre about all of this, but I think it's really important that we need to change our vocabulary. We don't go to church. We go to join the church gathered. That's so important to me. Where did this idea of a place come from? Well, you know, we've inherited the, the English word church from a, from a German word, Kirche, which is a location. The better use or the better word is the Greek word ekklesia. And an ekklesia is a purposeful gathering of people. 
And so the word ecclesia shows up in the in the, the the classic Greek stuff, where the where the people came together for a purpose, together to accomplish something of meaning. So again, if you're Spanish, you know the ecclesia or the gracia in in in, in Brazilian. But they have a much better word. The church is not a place or a building. The church is people that have a love for Jesus and who want to make a difference. So then the next question is, is how do we, how do we know this and, and what does it look like when the church gathers? The simplest way of expressing what church is, it doesn't have to be 50 people or 500, but here's what Matthew 18, 20 says, and quoting Jesus, it says, for where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. I would like for us to break the stranglehold that church only happens on Sunday. That would say it's an event. But we are the church. We are in fellowship. We are in communion. And so the reality is me plus Jesus is two. Me plus Jesus and anyone else, whether it's another person or a thousand or five thousand or whatever, that the church is just simply that. That is where two or three gather in his name. Now, I ask this question, why do we gather? Is it because of tradition? Is it because it's something that looks good? Or are we gathering in Jesus' name? Are we gathering and saying, Jesus, change me today. Jesus, encourage me today. Jesus, feed me today. Jesus, help me to remember why we are called to meet together, what, that, what we are called to do. I, I just really am so passionate about this, especially in this emerging new world, either in midst or post-pandemic. I want to challenge all of us, myself include, included, let's be the church. Let's be the church. Let's be aware that we are the church and that people's view of, of what the church is or could be or should be, we should be walking embodiments of that. I am so passionate about that. When people come in contact with me, do they see Jesus? When people are around me, are they convicted? Not because I am judgmental and says, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do this. But are they convicted by the fact that they see Jesus, a, a God who loves and cares and wants their very best? That's the church. So what's the mission of the church? We read about it and uh, it's called the great commission, not the great suggestion. But my pastor, Barry McGaffin, I like how he said it. It is the co-mission. Co, meaning together, mission. What is our co-mission? Well, it starts in Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and preach the gospel and teach them to observe all that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. If you've been in church for any length of time, you have heard countless sermons on the Great Commission. My question to you is, my question to me is, though I can quote it, am I doing it? Am I doing it? Do I really believe that I am a partner with God? Do I really believe that it is a co-mission that when I go, Jesus goes with me. Where Jesus goes, that's where I go. We want to make a difference. And now I love Ephesians 3, 9 and 10, and I'm going to read it for you. It says, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery for which the ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, right now, whenever you watch this and when I preach the same sermon on this coming Sunday, now through the church, through the church, not through the building, not through the programs, not through the event, but through the church. That's you. That's me. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This word in Greek for manifold, it has to do with multicolored. It's kind of a, a full spectrum. And I want you to know, I just think, I sometimes I think about this and I think, oh God, there's just so much more so much more that you have for us. Oh, Lord God, I want the whole enchilada. I don't want to settle for just, you know, 16 colors. I remember when computers first came out, we said, oh, wow, my computer's got 16 colors. And now it's like a bazillion. But that the manifold wisdom of God might be revealed. 
Can we believe for that? Can we give ourselves to that? Can we dedicate ourselves to that? Then we come back to the local church. I believe in the local church. I believe in the phrase that the local church is the hope for the world. We see in Acts 2.47 and in Philemon 2, it says that people, believers, join themselves to local expressions of the body of Christ. Now, that's a real hot spot for me. Now, let me give you a, a really, uh, a, what I think is a clear example. So let's say, for instance, that we're in World War II. I, I mean, I don't want to go about whether wars are good, bad, or, or ugly. But in World War II, can you imagine, here's this person walking around with a uniform uh, behind enemy lines or whatever, and they run into the army, and he says, who are you? And he says, uh, you know, I'm so-and-so. Well, you know, what's your unit? I don't have a unit. Who's your commanding officer? I don't have a commanding officer. Or if it is, it's Dwight Eisenhower. He says, do you think Dwight Eisenhower knows who you are? That what happens, people became a part of a place where they could be known and be known and a place of accountability. And I have watched this. I've been in vocational ministry now 42 years. 42 years. I didn't think I was that old, but I am. And what I have observed is that Christians who live in isolation, I don't need God. I can commune with God on the golf course. And, or I, you know, I, you know, I said my prayers or whatever, but I have observed that when people start to isolate themselves and get disenfranchised from a local expression of the church of Jesus Christ, they are people who get picked off by the enemy of our soul. I watch it time and time again. I don't need church. Wow. You are the church, but you need to be in relationship that God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some, but come together to encourage one another all the more as the day approaches. And so I'm not beating you up. I'm just saying, if you are a lone ranger because I love you, you are in danger. And whether it's in this local church or whether it's in some other local church, maybe you're seeing this someplace else in Canada, my encouragement to you is you need to find a local church where you can be known and be known and that you, you are, are held accountable and where people can, can say, look, I think I'm really concerned for you. I'm praying for you. I'll tell you a true story. When Lottie and I came to Sunshine Hills here in 1982, there, our first Sunday we had 21 people. And very quickly thereafter, a couple of weeks later, there was this family that came in, two small girls, and, and they came in, and, and they, they, I said, well, how did you find out about it? She says, well, we were watching Robert Schuller, you know, The Hour of Power on TV. And Robert Schuller looked in the camera, and he said, somewhere in your community is a local church that needs you. And so they said, they looked at each other, and they said, I guess that's a message for us. And they were driving down 120th Scott Road here, and, and they saw this sign that was very crude. It was it was it was plywood, and it had been hand painted and whatever. That it was it was a long time ago. And and all in all, they they came in and they saw that, and they came in. And I said, "How did you show up?" Says, "Well, Robert Schuler sent us." I said, "Well, great." And they became an integral part of our church. They, uh, uh, the, the the wife served on our church council, and and we watched their girls grow. But I want you to know that somewhere out there is a local church that needs you. Uh, there needs to be a place where you can grow and develop in your understanding of what it means to be the church, what it means to be Christian. It is a place of belonging and working together for the common good. I believe that people are desperately seeking connection. Now, here's what Acts 2.42 says about the activity of, of the local church or of the early churches. Four things. One is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and doctrine. Paul writes young Timothy, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So the church people dedicated themselves to coming together and having somebody like me say, hey, let's think about this. This is what the word of God says. And I'm one of those people who say, well, doctrine is divisive. I say that the absence of good doctrine is divisive. When we know what we believe, that's when we can say, yes, that fits, and no, that doesn't. And I think it's really important for us to be people of the word. And one of the things that I say when I read something or somebody says, well, God said this, or even in a sermon, I'm listening very discerning, and it says that we're supposed to test the spirit and hold fast to that which is good, that we need to do that. Secondly, they devoted themselves to fellowship. I already quoted Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 about don't, 
you know, says, and let us consider how we may encourage one another on to love and good need, and good deeds. Third, they voted themselves to the breaking of bread. That one of the, the most specific there is communion. Communion, when the church gathers, and whether that's two or three, you know, you can have communion at home, you and your husband and your wife or your friends or your family. Uh, it doesn't take a priest to do that. But there's something about being in the presence of Jesus and where we are reminded again of what Jesus did for us by coming to earth in the flesh, showing us the Father, dying on the cross, rising from the dead, and realizing that the, his blood is the currency of eternity. And also, there's just something spiritual about eating together once COVID allows us to do that. And the fourth one is they devoted themselves to prayer. Acts 1.14 says, and they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. So what did they share? They shared meals together. Uh, Pastor Danny talked about that they shared one another's heavy burdens in the midst of crisis. And ever, if ever there was a time for people to share one another's burden, now is the time. Satan wants to isolate you and burden you down. But what happens is, is I remember I was a, a leader in a, in, a, in a boys club and we went hiking with this group of boys, 12 to 18. And I was one of the leaders and we, we did a, a, an eight mile hike over an, a mile elevation change. And, and some of the younger boys, they started to just peter out towards the end. So there was a few of us. We said, we're going to go on ahead, and we left some leaders behind. We pressed on, we dropped our packs, and we came back, and we picked up those packs of those, those younger, weaker boys, and they got to the top of the summit. That's a picture of what the church people in the church, people who are the church, do for one another. They shared resources, and they shared their homes, and they shared their lives. Here are some behaviors. They prayed together. They were a community. They devoted themselves to teaching. They developed relationships by going house to house. I look forward to the day when a lot of these restrictions are relaxed. They worship together. They practice their gifts both in and outside the church building. That's another, that's a whole other sermon. But I would challenge you to look at the book of Acts that the majority of the expressions of the gifts of the Holy Spirit were, were, were expressed outside when the church wasn't gathered, but in the marketplace. If ever there was a time for Holy Spirit-inspired and empowered people to be using their gifts of discernment and encouragement and, and, and love and grace and all of those things, now is that time we need to realize that the church gathers to be strengthened so that they can be the church in a world that desperately needs it. They baptize new believers. And I want to encourage you, if you've not been water baptized since you believed, I want to encourage you to do that. It's a, it's a point of obedience. It's a point of obedience, and obedience brings, brings blessing. They engaged in missionary activities. They shared their faith openly. Now, I am a Canadian by choice. I'm a Canadian citizen. I'm proud of it. But there's something in our Canadian culture that says you, you, you can believe whatever you want, but just don't share your faith. I would suggest to you people are resistant to being preached at, but I would suggest to you that when you share your life and it's something that's authentic, that they will say, what's different about you? Show me why you are the way that you are. They discipled new believers. And again, it's important not only for people to make a decision for Jesus, but that, that you are taught what it looks like to be a Christian. And that's another reason for being part of the church gathered. And they understood, and this is important, that they could accomplish more collectively than they could individually. So in conclusion, I want to read this. The church is not an organization. It is not a place. It is not an event we attend. It is people in its purest expression, people being authentic witnesses of the life-changing relationship they have with Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, I'm always challenged in a good way whenever I talk about your bride. Jesus, we want to be that bride that's radiant and and, 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 and fertile and, and, and seeing people birthed into your kingdom. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us to ferret out the, the viruses that have invaded our operating system as Christians to twist and pervert and to overwrite the, the, the DNA code, the, the, the spiritual code of, of what it means to be your children. I pray this in Jesus' name. Help us to be the church. 
Now I close and I want to just say, maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus, but right now where you are, you can close your eyes and you can say, Jesus, I want to be part of your church. I accept that you died on the cross for me. You are the very son of God. You paid the price for all of my sin and shame that you died on the cross, you rose from the dead, and that if I invite you into my life, it will that you will come in and we can walk together. So Lord, I pray if there's anybody praying that prayer, I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would feel your presence and knowing that they have been heard by you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Let's go. Let's be church. I have the, uh, the honor today of expressing to you an opportunity that we have as a church One of the things that we have been doing over these many years as we have been involved in short-term missions endeavors, and I want to say as the lead pastor, I was late to the party on this, and it was really uh, Tamara Osborne that really sparked the interest of us going to Mexico, and we went for 10 years down to Mexico, and we made a difference. In fact, I was just um, at a church that's being planted by one of the Mexican families that we touched in one of those places at Campo, and it was so exciting to see they've got a full on a worship team that led us in worship through music, and and um, he preached, and I had an opportunity to dedicate. So we are making a difference. Uh, well, I have the the privilege of of I've been invited to be a part of a short term missions trip in January, uh, where um, uh, my good friend John Overholt, he and Debbie, they went to Costa Rica, and they went to the Guanacaste region of Costa Rica, where there were no. Four square churches, and they were very apostolic, and they raised up uh, uh, eight or ten churches. So John uh, really asked if I would come with him. So on on January the twentieth through February fourth, um, I am the uh, the chosen person that is the team. Uh, you can't give to an individual, but you can give to the mission. That uh, I'm going to be um, flying into uh, Costa Rica, and we're going to be visiting the churches which Lottie and I visited three times um, in in Costa Rica, and then uh, we're going to be driving with one of the Costa Rican pastors from Costa Rica uh, to Managua, Nicaragua, where we will be being joined by some other Foursquare pastors from Canada. So we're going to be putting on a leadership training seminar for 70 church leaders. I love building into church leaders. That's part of our spiritual DNA. When we have gone on missions trips, that's what we have done. We don't build houses. We build people. And what's going to happen is is that we're going to have this, and then we're also going to be ministering in local churches in that area. So here's the the opportunity that um, I'm going to ask you as our mission's focus uh, to to, uh, participate with me. We are giving to this endeavor. And and again, I want you to know that uh, I am committed uh, to covering this, uh, whatever the shortfall is, that that I am so committed to missions that that I'm going to do. But I'm asking you to partner with the Foursquare Church of Canada and with with me as the team of Designate uh, to reach to Costa Rica and Nicaragua. So here's what's going to happen is that the overall trip is going to cost about uh, $1,500 Canadian. That includes flight and the accommodations. But then on top of that, that's just to help me as the, as the team be able to get there. And then we are also wanting to raise money uh, to, f- to be able to feed these people lunch when they come from these various places. And so our goal for the whole team is $750 to $1,000 for, for lunch, um, lunch money. <laughs> and nobody's going to beat them up on the way to school. So anyways, I want you to just uh, pray about uh, your, your uh, partnering uh, with Sunshine Hills and with Foursquare Canada as I'm the, the one that has been designated to go. And I'm just praying that, you know, the Holy Spirit will move on you to to participate with me as we um, give money to make this a reality. So thanks very much. And if you have any questions uh, that I didn't answer, feel free to talk to me. And uh, the trip will be in January 2022. God bless you.